Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our show today. Um, our guest today has been in the legal profession for a long time. She has worked in the judiciary. Um, she has had her own practice. Uh, she has had a stint in politics, uh, in the executive as well. Um, I will invite her to introduce herself and then we'll ask her a few questions about her professional journey. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Martha Karoa, senior counsel. And apart from being an advocate of the High Court, I'm also a practicing politician. So I practice both law and politics. Ah, beautiful. Uh, senior counsel, uh, just give us a brief description of your journey, um, where it all began. I think when I was a young girl in primary school, I accompanied my father to the local court at Kirugoya. I don't know what it is I liked about the court, whether it's the attention the magistrate appeared to be getting. And you know, in the lo those local pl places, the magistrate is known as judge. Even though there was no high court then, yeah. but people just say judge yeah. when they are referring to the magistrate out of the court. And uh, I told my dad as we left that I would like to be a judge. And he told me he had no objection, but uh, told me I would have to work very hard and I think it stayed with me because later on when I was uh, doing my O levels right from around form 3 I knew that I wanted to go for A levels those days after form 4 there was 5 and 6 which we used to call A levels mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to go for A levels as a bridge to the university because that was the route you do all levels, A levels, university. And I knew I wanted to go to the university to do law. So when I was studying for my Form 4 exams, I was actually conscious that I must do well in subjects that can form a combination. I was arts oriented because the school I was in was not doing sciences after Form 3. Schools without a laboratory could not do science beyond Form 2. Mm. So Form 3 and 4, no science subjects. I was arts oriented and I chose my combination. I knew that in A-levels, I would do literature in English, history, divinity, and if any of these subjects became a problem, I could do geography. So I had choices of four. And when studying, I was emphasizing on these subjects so that I would have a combination. I would not only pass well, but have a combination for the university. And uh, my dad, who used to be a teacher those days, I used to tell him the books I needed because I was in Karate Girls, which was then was not government aided. It's what you called Harambe. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have all the teachers. So I would discuss with my dad, and for literature, he used to buy me the guides that the teachers use, Minerva guides. And therefore, even though there is no teacher, you will be able to get the explanation of what is needed. And they served me very well. Mm. I knew I wouldn't do well in maths because without an instructor, most of Form 3 and Form 4, there is no way you could hack it in maths. So I knew mentally that when I'm doing my exam, I'll just go write my name, draw something, wait for half an hour because I don't know whether it happens today. You couldn't leave the exam room before half an hour had passed. So I just wasted the half hour mm. and then left. Mm. So I had my division two with a good combination to go to, to A-levels. And A-levels, I came to Nairobi Girls. This days is called Moi Nairobi Girls. Did my A-levels, passed very well. My class passed very well. Out of 35, um, 27 of us came to the university. Oh. So it really was a good uh, whatever. Oh, and good uh, five of us were picked for law. Mm -hmm. I think Nairobi girls had the second highest number after Alliance boys, which had eight. Mm -hmm. And I did my law. I enjoyed university, that I must tell you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, after university, went to the law school, enjoyed the law school. 
and two months before our pupilage ended, those days the government needed workers and they used to headhunt in the you know, colleges when people are finishing. So they came when we had finished exams and we were now finishing the last bit of pupilage around July, actually June because work I started in July. Pupilage was supposed to end in September. So they came, they did interviews for magistrates, for DOs, for people to work with the cooperatives, people to work in foreign affairs, so basically for government offices. And those of us who were taken left the others completing pupillage and went to work. And I was posted to Nakuru. I worked in Nakuru. After two years, I came to Nairobi. Worked in Nairobi for another, actually Nakuru, it was one year. Mm -hmm. Worked for five years in Nairobi and then left for private practice. By then, I had one child and I was expecting the second one. And the salary of magistrate was so little. It was just about 3,000 shillings after deductions you take home 2,600. But then expenses were not what they are. Yeah. I could, you could get a house in Golf Course Estate, which was new and very neat that time, yeah. for 1,200. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. if you share with someone, it will be six each. Yeah. So the money was livable, but it's still a squeeze. Yeah. So I realized I can't make it with children on a government salary. My husband then was working for the army but still you need to supplement the family income so i quit being a magistrate started a private practice and uh, the rest is history when uh, private practice i became active in the law society and uh, soon within two years was elected a council member yeah. for nairobi there was no Nairobi and up country. The law society oh. was one, and the total number of lawyers in Kenya mm -hmm. was just slightly over 2,000. So even those days when we were doing requisitions, all you need is money to send out letters to 2,000 people. It wasn't that hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we weren't many. And in Nairobi, you sort of knew each other on the corridor. Now it's impossible. Yeah. yeah so I entered into the politics of the law society, went on to politics of the nation because we were calling on the government to respect the rule of law, democracy and human rights, to give people their democratic uh, space and to respect human rights. Those were days of detention without trial. It were days of harassment. If you are critical of the government, we as the council of the law society were taken to court and tried for the non-existence offense of talking politics because the court had given an injunction injuncting the law society of kenya from speaking in quotes politics yeah. what is speaking politics hmm. if you comment on the government failures on the rule of law it will be deemed to be politics yeah. so we were taken to court and the court found us guilty and fined each of us ten thousand we didn't pay the fine, but the case was attracting so many members of the public. So they paid the fine, even before we knew it. And the court did not give us an option of jail. They had said, if we don't pay the fine, they'll come and attach our things. Yeah, but um, it, it's, a, it's a long story. A lot of things happened. After that, I went to court to represent a divorce client. And the judge I appeared before, a Mr. Mbito, reckoned that because I had been found guilty of contempt of court, that he couldn't hear me, I needed to apologize. And I told him I couldn't apologize. We had already been fined. This is, uh, you know, subjecting me to double jeopardy. Yeah. And I was saying it would amount to judicial lynching in the sense that it means that every chamber you pass, they kick you. And you've already been... Whatever. And then I'm saying I was not the only defendant, call the others then. Plus, I'm not a defendant in this file. I'm a lawyer. Yeah. He would hear none of it. Mm -hmm. So he purported to suspend me from practice. And for a month I couldn't practice because a court order, even though illegal, must be obeyed. Yeah. Yeah. So it took me about a month to get a stay order from the Court of Appeal, which was the highest court then. And uh, I went on and was active in politics 
of the law society and of the nation, we went on demanding Mount Party, demanding respect for human rights and all that, and agitating when three lawyers were detained for representing unpopular clients. These were Mohammed Ibrahim, who is now a, a Supreme Court judge, yeah. uh, Getobwi Manyara, who then was the editor of the Nairobi Law Mantri, which was very critical of the government, but also very useful because there were no re law reports then. Yeah. If you wanted to see some of the decided cases, you bought a law monthly. Uh -huh. And then Dr. John Kaminwa, merely for representing people the government did not like. Mm. Like Ibrahim had taken a case to court, questioning the screening of Somalis before giving them national IDs, which was discriminatory. Mm. And uh, Dr. Kaminwa had represented a former civil servant who had been um, dropped by the government and was being hounded and many other clients. So we picketed as young lawyers, mm. declaring a strike and not going to court and issuing statements day in, day out. And uh, within three weeks, and we used to meet at the Law Society offices at uh, the professional center, that's where the Law Society was situated. Mm -hmm. Police would bring trucks with tear gas and the riot police, and we are just four or five people. Mm -hmm. You know, we were insisting on using the Law Society premises, mm -hmm. but uh, they would harass us. But in 21 days, because we used to issue statements which would then be faxed around the world, there was no email was faxes to human rights organizations uh, within three weeks they released the detainees the lawyers yeah. you know yeah. and we felt we had tasted success and uh, as things went on within another one year or so Kandu relented and uh, they passed a law in Parliament and allowed the return of plural politics so one thing led to another by then, we, I and other women, active women, had formed, and one of them was Judge Martha Kome, lawyer Lilian Wanjira, mm. uh, Aida Odinga, and many others. We formed the League of Kenya Women Voters as a political lobby group to encourage women to run. Mm. That was in May of 1992. Remember that they have, uh, the return to multi-party was December 1991. So we were ad advocating for women to take up their space in the political arena. And I realized that I'm one of the women who should do that. Mm. Because if I'm already well known because of agitating, then I'm one of those wom women that should take up the mantle. Mm. And I decided to run. And the rest is history. Mm. And for the first 10 years, 92, to 2002, I practiced both law and politics. I was going to the court in the morning, parliament in the afternoon, except Wednesdays, mm -hmm. when it's members' motion. If there was a motion I'm interested in, I would then go to, to parliament. Mm -hmm. And that's how I went on. I grew my practice because I did cases that are now reported. I then was going under the name Martha Njoka. So if you see any case in family law, in constitutional law, in um, uh, prerogative reads under the name Martha Njoka, that's me. Uh -huh. um, after 10 years, we successfully were able to remove Moi, and the gov Kibaki government came in mm -hmm. in December of 2002. December 2002 means the last day, 30th. Yeah. Yeah. So it's practically 2003. Yeah, yeah. I became a minister, and I had already made a decision that I wind up my practice because I wanted to be a full time politician. Yeah. There had been that commission that had, in, uh, had proposed increased wages for members of parliament. So when they increased the wages, we were actually supposed to be full-time. We were being paid more to become full-time. Mm -hmm. But because the law that was passed didn't say so, we took the money and literally conned Kenyans because we continued doing many things. Mm -hmm. But for me, I had already entered government. I had already made plans to wind up my practice, so I wound up my practice. January 2003, I wrote to the Law Society and told them the lawyer I had appointed to wind up the farm. And I didn't practice again um, 
even when I resigned as a minister in 2009, I didn't return to practice until 2015, when I was already out of uh, elected politics, but not out of politics. I renewed my certificate for purposes of being able to consult yeah. and write yourself as an advocate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then 2017, after my run for governor in Kirinyaga, which was successful, but my vote was stolen, yeah. I again renewed my certificate in order to join my lawyer, Gitobu Imanyara, and help him, assist him in court as a lawyer, mm -hmm. to be able to stand as a lawyer in my case. And after the case, I've taken on a few briefs uh, as lead counsel, because I really don't want to open an office again. Mm. So that is, uh, is the long and short of my journey. Mm. Activism within the law society led me on to national politics. I had no idea that it would pay dividends of me becoming a household name in Kenya and therefore being able, when I ran in Kichugu, this helped me a lot, yeah. you see? Yeah. But I didn't do it consciously knowing it will help. Yeah. And that's why there is a saying that when you do good, you do good unto yourself. Yeah. So the rest is history. I'm still active mm. in the political arena because the things that go wrong in this country, nobody else will correct them. It's us. Yeah. We owe it. It's our civic duty to see that something good happens to our country. It's our civic duty to ensure that justice is delivered to the people. It's our duty to ensure that we uphold the rule of law and democracy. Unfortunately, we always don't do that as a corporate body, as the lawyers, mm -hmm. because in every scandal, yeah, there'll be a lawyer, mm -hmm. whether in private practice or in the public se sector, involved in authorizing or giving wrong advice to the government. In every case, right now we have very many cases that are in court and if you look at them they really ought not to be the sole purpose is to earn a fat check from government so we are not always doing our duty but it's not just lawyers as professionals we have failed our country yeah. and it's time to think about it because what pushed me into politics is realizing that you don't practice politics in a vacuum yeah. it's within the socio economic and political context so the politics of the day matter yeah. because it determines yes. the environment in which you work in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still at it trying to improve that environment. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage federal lawyers, yeah. we don't all have to run for office, but you can mobilize others either to support those running. Yeah. They need not be lawyers to support good candidates. You also must, must join political parties of choice so that you can shape policy in this country. Mm -hmm. In developed world, why politicians resign yeah. is that their parties are populated by the middle class, okay. the professionals, the business people. Yeah. They are able to tell off and pressurize leaders, yeah. you know? Yeah. But in Kenya, mm -hmm. the few elite are only the ones running for office like myself. Yeah. Majority of other party, party members will be the very grassroots people. Yeah. Not that they cannot differentiate between right and wrong, but they are so burdened by bread and butter issues daily. Yeah. So they will not have the space to be able to hold the leaders to account. Yeah. Or they also don't meet those leaders. But as professionals, we are likely to meet in the corridors, yeah. in social places. Yes. So if those people are members of the party, that is why you see in South Africa, the ANC is so strong that it can actually chase away a president. Yeah. We saw them chase um, Tambo Becky. He hadn't done much, but he was removed from office. We have seen them remove Zuma. Yeah. The party is very strong. Mm -hmm. Here parties are not even able to deal with members of parliament. <laughs> and when you deal with them, because now Kenya attempted dealing with members in 2013, yeah. Yeah. you find the court issuing an, an injunction and then putting the file aside and not finalizing it yeah. and letting the members have the whole term. Yeah. All those things, bringing discipline in parties, bringing discipline in the society, yeah. are part of our civic duty. Yeah. So over to you, dear professionals, but whatever you set your mind on, yeah. 
do it and do it well. Mm -hmm. There's no two way about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Um, thank you very much. We we often ask a lot of questions for that information to come out. So thank you very much for being yeah. brief. Um, I'll ask a question about um, women rights. Mm -hmm. um, and you've had the benefit of practicing uh, law in various government regimes yeah. and various uh, constitutional dispensations. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, of course, we grew up at a point where the executive was very strong. Yeah. Uh, but now we do have the two that gender rule. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts? Which has not been implemented. That's yeah. part yeah. of the constitution that has not been implemented. Yeah. I personally audited the county assemblies and out of the 49 county assemblies, mm -hmm. is it 47, Seven. only eight are compliant. Yeah. I may not be able to name all of them, mm -hmm. but one is Wasangishu. Garissa, uh, is it Tana River? I mm. can't name all of them, but only a few eight county assemblies are compliant. Mm. They have at least 34, and some have 34 and above, mm. of women, which means they have complied with the gender rule, because the gender rule says not more than two thirds. Yes. If you apportion that, you will see that one third, because you need to know what is one third, what is two thirds, is 33.3. Yes. Yeah. Two thirds is 66.6. .6. So if you allow it to go beyond 66.6 .6 to 67, yes. you will have offended the rule. Yeah. Yeah. For, so for the upper <laughs> limit, you have to cut it at 66. Yeah. For the lower limit, then you cap it at 34. So it becomes 34 to 66. Yeah. Yeah. And if you count the number of males in the executive, you realize that cabinet is just about 31%, even as now it doesn't fulfill. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, it's only with uh, the last elevation of uh, Justice Kome as CJ that they complied, yeah. because now the ratio of 3 to 7 is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 5 to 7 is not okay yeah. five to two is not okay yeah. you go to the electoral commission it was compliant before the commissioners resigned yeah. now mm -hmm. the panel although it had a letter from the national gender and equality commission telling them of the four slots you need to pick three women and one man yeah. they went ahead and pe picked two women two men and parliament again had a letter from the gender, National Gender and Equality Commission, being told you must not, you must, when passing, considering the names, do consider that they are unconstitutional. They went ahead and they passed. Yeah. Yeah. So the institutions that ought to be implementing, the executive and parliament, are not honoring the constitution, although their order of office is to uphold and defend the constitution. Yeah. As lawyers, what are we doing about it? Yeah. I know the law society has not been left behind and they too had petitioned. They were among the petitioners when the Chief Justice declared Parliament, the former Chief Justice mm -hmm. declared Parliament unconstitutional. The courts have let us down because that case has been dragging since last year. Yeah. If you give a stay, it's a case that is time bound because if the end of Parliament comes, then the subject matter disappears. Yeah. Yeah. The court is in control of its own calendar and in charge of the court. It is not a good thing that this case does not even have a date as we speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you've talked about uh, the young lawyers during your time yeah. agitating for multipartism yeah. and activism. Yeah. And uh, I want you to look back yeah. and then you also look at uh, how the young boy is active today. Mm. And do you think that uh, the young boy is in good hands now? I'll say yes and no because we are not talking of individuals. Individuals running it may be okay, but as a corporate body, yeah. no. Mm. During our time, we campaigned without treating anyone. But now, law society campaigns have become like political campaigns. People treat. We've got to get corruption out of our campaigns. It's not about who has more money. In fact, anybody giving professionals money to be elected is a suspect, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And because our professional bodies have now been invested in corruption, then that corruption, if you elect people because they gave you money, that profession will go to the law society, corruption will go to the law society, corruption will find its way to the Judicial Service Commission, to the judiciary. We are actually oiling the wheels of corruption and bad governance. Yeah. Yeah. So the young bar ought to discuss, intros in introspect, and ask yourselves, what kind of country do you wish to bring up your children because you are the people who are active getting married getting children getting families yeah. what environment do you want to bring up your children in we as the senior citizens can only do what we can i'm active today but one cannot be active forever yeah. we need to join hands and make this country better i brought up my children in a better environment than you're bringing up yours the public schools were still good. Yeah. The roads were better. I mean, in terms of traffic, in terms of what? Yeah. The hospitals were better. Services had not deteriorated to where they are. They were still, we were still complaining. Yeah. But things are going crazy. And you must ask yourselves, because when, and it's the same in politics, when we vote in corrupt leaders or leaders who are unsuitable, hoping that they'll do us favors, Lawyers now are over 15,000. Let's say we are heading to 20,000. Yeah. How many people can any regime, how many lawyers can be given favors? It's very few yeah. who get on the gravity train. Yeah. So I'd rather better leaders, but an enabling environment for me to work out a living. Yeah. When I became a private, um, I joined private practice, I didn't need anybody to hold my hand. I just needed my office. One person comes, two people come, some who know you, some have been referred. By word of mouth, you start getting a stream of clients without much ado. Yeah. Today, it is so impossible even to get a job because instead of expanding our economy, we are creating and deserving millionaires with that money. And money in a bank account to make you a millionaire is money that is not circulating, so it's not helping the economy yeah. produce the jobs it should. Yeah. So sometimes, as not just as young lawyers, as young people, you may be supporting your own uh, oppression. Somebody ate your jobs. Somebody is going to make the professional environment very bad for you because when they hug all the jobs, those in position, yeah. then it will be a bad thing and that's why I was happy when the current representative, male representative of uh, the JSC said, campaigned on a plot platform that he will not practice. Because yeah. it's not fair to appear before judges whose promotion and welfare depends on you. Mm. You see? Yeah. Mm. Conflict of interest. Your ethics class as you become a lawyer tells you about that. Yeah. So why are we overlooking those small things? Our ethical foundation is being eroded. Our moral foundation as a society, that is the public morality, is being eroded. What can you and me do about it so that our country becomes better? Uh, this one I'll ask you. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the numbers you were back then. Yeah. And how easy it was to get into the job market. Yeah. And of course the practice was a bit traditional back then. Yeah. Uh, litigation. Yeah. Uh, now we've seen new areas of practice come up. You have data protection, you have commercial that is almost edging out. Yeah. Um, what litigation used to be. Yeah. Uh, so what would your advice be to a young lawyer now who's joining the market? It's just to make sure that you are current in the tools of trade you should have. Today's lawyer must be conversant with the internet. Today's lawyer must be tech savvy. Yeah. There are areas that were not there my time. Yeah. Technology had not advanced to where it is. So the young lawyer must search the areas that they need to sharpen their skills. Even the older lawyer, if you want to remain in practice, there are areas you really must. Remember. We were all forced to become conversant with virtual appearance in court yeah, yeah. and I've actually enjoyed it because I've been able to accept briefs that are far flung 
briefs that I would have rejected and said I don't want to travel. Yeah. I've done a case in Nanyuki, I've done a case in Malindi, just seated in my office. Mm -hmm. I've done a case in Mombasa, and even within Nairobi, I didn't have to travel anywhere. Just from my study, I'm able to do cases. Sometimes, if it's uh, like one day I was going to play golf in Limuru, I went very early so that nine found me in Limuru seated at a nice corner. I did my case and then went to tee off. <laughs> so that flexibility is good. Yeah. Another day we were uh, traveling up country for a funeral yeah. and I had a mention. Yeah. When nine came, we just stopped at a petrol station and I did my mention and we moved on. Mm. So the flexibility of technology that technology brings is great. Yeah. But we've all had to be not just tech savvy, but to ensure that you have either Wi-Fi or bundles. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And then you have seen the uh, areas people are tripping. It may not be in this country, but you see people now, because you are at your home, you dress improperly. Yeah. Because if you are seated, nobody will see how you are dressed except the upper body. Yeah. But if you forget and stand, yeah. that's when people will know that you are not fully dressed. Yeah. Yeah. Or it was rumored that uh, uh, the court was able to see one lawyer was still in bed. You know? <laughs> because it depends on how you tilt your camera. Yeah. Yeah. So that there has to be now um, rules for virtual hearing. Yeah. That you must be properly robed. There's a case we did, an appeal we did, and uh, we robed. Yeah, because the At court... Home. Yeah, because the court was robed. You yeah. just robe in your living room. Yeah. 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 It also gives you a good feeling. When I'm going, when I'm coming to my study to, to do a case yeah. or to do a meeting, because we also do me virtual meetings, it yeah. has cut on international travel as well. Yeah. I like to wake up, if it's a nine o'clock matter, wake up early, dress up, because it gives you that psych you're going into an office. Yeah. Yeah. So I enter that office fully ready. And I'll have, that's the, the orientation of my mind that I'm in serious, whatever. If you take it lightly, then yeah. you might forget yeah. that you are actually in serious business. Yeah. So international travel has been cut to zero. We just do webinars, you know. Yeah. And I think it's a good thing. Yeah. We all would like to travel some time, but it's good also to learn to live with the new normal. Yeah. Funeral services are becoming virtual. Because if we crowd, then we might do more funerals thereafter. Yeah. Visiting our parents has also become something of a hazard. If you're not careful, you might not just take greetings and uh, comradere, you might leave them with uh, whatever. So we are all learning the new normal. Yeah. yeah, and I think there are many, many things to learn. Yeah. The profession has grown but also this pandemic has brought in many, many things, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, you'll forgive me, I'll ask, uh, yeah. mine are very simple questions. Yeah. There's two. Yeah. One is, uh, what does Martha Karua do when uh, they're not practicing law, when they're not doing activism, when they're not in politics? What, what, what fun things do you do? I socialize yes. with family and friends. Yeah. I swim when I can. Mm -hmm. I play golf like I've just come from playing golf. Yeah. I walk. I'm just the person next door. I do the things other people do. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the last one, mm. we can't let you go off without, uh, without asking this. Is Martha going for presidency? I'm going for Governor Kirinyaga. Okay. I have unfinished business with the presidency, yes. but God giving me long life. Yeah. It is possible to serve people of Kirinyaga yeah. and later on serve Kenya. Okay. At the age of 63, going to 64 in two, three weeks, yeah. I consider myself politically young. Yeah. Yes. So there's time for all that. Okay. Yeah. So, so. Mm. so, so. Asante sana. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Nje. Okay. Yeah. Karibuni. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the bar, members of senior bar, members of junior bar. Today, we've come to the end of today's show. We had a very interesting guest. Uh, she really wanted us to mention uh, a few of the people who have mentored her. Uh, Feroz Naroji, uh, senior, Paul Muita senior. Um, Dr. John Haminua. Dr. John Haminua, 
uh, and so many others who have been instrumental in her journey to becoming who she is. Cheers. Apana, uh, uh, apana, no, we can no, try it's fine. again. Ah, it's no, but it's fine. See, it's I was looking at the name. Yeah. It's fine. No, no, I have ah, to look at the name. It's fine.